Welcome. Um, my name is Ryan William Downey, and I am the Associate Artistic Director of the Brick Theater. We're thrilled to have you with us here tonight for a very special look inside the process on a, on a new work from great playwright Cara Dad Sfitch. We're thrilled to have Cara Dad uh, with us. Um, I'm fortunate. Hey there, Cara Dad. Welcome. Uh, thrilled to have Hello. them. Yes, um, I'm fortunate to uh, count Gary Dad as a friend now through Twitter and um, as well as being a prolific writer, um, songwriter, editor, and translator. Also a great tweeter and a very engaging person online. And that's how uh, we got, got to know one another and have um, now done a few things here with the brick and uh, we're thrilled to have Gary Dad. Um, as I mentioned, I'm sure most of you know, if you're here, Caridad is all about the work and people who do the work. And it's something we really admire. Um, her ethos is totally in line with what we're doing at the Brick Theater. Um, if you're joining us 
maybe you're familiar with Care Dad, but not with us. We're, we are an experimental theater here in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I'm actually in Astoria right now. We're in Williamsburg. Rick's been around for about 20 years. Um, the creative team that I'm a part of, we took it over in January 2020. Probably the worst time in human history to take over a theater, but here we are. We're still going. We've weathered the storm. Um, and we present all sorts of boundary pushing uh, theater. We're really proud of the work that we present there. And uh, we hope that you'll come uh, see us, see something with us there soon. Um, if you're not in New York, we do, uh, we do post many of our shows online whenever we can. And we have a pretty extensive uh, back catalog of virtual theater on the uh, Brick Theater YouTube channel. So I do recommend uh, checking us out there as well. And if you do come through New York, um, please stop in for a show. Uh, reminder that we are recording this uh, evening's reading and we will be sending it out to everyone afterward. It'll be a password protected recording that you can watch on the cloud, just like if you were streaming something uh, on YouTube. And so you just enter a password and that'll be good for um, 14 days. Uh, from tomorrow. Okay, so you will have an opportunity to either re-listen or, um, you know, uh, that'll be for also folks that weren't able to join us here live. All right, so we're, we're thrilled to have, like I said, we're thrilled to have um, uh, Care Dad here. I do encourage you to check out their show that is currently running at Repertorio and NYC, uh, Evoluna, um, and it is running in repertory. So um, performances um, are, are spread out over a long period of time. So there, there's quite a few opportunities to catch it. It'll be up and then go down, come back. Um, so I just shared a link in the, uh, or I'll, I'll share a link in the chat now. Um, if you're interested, we do encourage you to go check out that show. All right. Um, so a reminder that this is a work in progress. Readings with Caridad it would be very interesting to See Carrie Dad reading the, the whole thing here. We're thrilled about that. And it, it, you know, so they're reading this as if we're at a table with a microphone and a small light, just reading the whole show. Okay. Um, without further ado, here's Carrie Dad. Thank you. The brick. Zero. The ante room. Prologue to the exhibit. A long time ago. A group of men sat in a room. They created a document that would change the world forever. This document was called the brick. This is their story, even if they will not always appear in it, because you could say their story became a version of the world. One, exhibit A, brick. Geologic time. Light. A person or more enter a room. This room is an archive, theater, and museum. They carry in their hands what looks like a brick. They smile as if they possess a secret. Maybe they say hi in many languages. Hi. Hola. Hello. Marhaba. Privet. Namaste. Ni hao. The person or more set the brick down upon a long table. Now, for now, the brick is in the spotlight, alone, sturdy, serene. The person or more say, this is a brick. It is made of clay, lime, magnesia, and iron oxide, and has been shaped and fired in a kiln. It is one of the greatest inventions in history. The brick beams, although the person more cannot detect its beam from where they're standing. When everything is gone, the person or more say, the air will exclaim, look at this brick. It's made thousands of cities. It's seen millions of wars. It's survived almost everything. Two, exhibit B, the room. This is a room. 
Fairlight, modest in design, a reconstruction of archaic cheek. You may not have an image in mind of what that looks like, but you can use the tools of weaponized nostalgia to imagine it. Or photographs. Uh, photographs aren't weapons of... <sighs> anyway, you wouldn't think much of it at first glance. This room contains past and future history. Now in this room, there is a table, a long table, the kind of table where decisions get made over lots of drinking. Espresso, wine, and sometimes orange juice to cleanse the palate, and sometimes cocaine, too, to cleanse the brain. In rooms like these, where decisions get made, there's always a table. I mean, you could say that in some countries it has something to do with Roman Catholicism, a desire to reenact the Last Supper. At some point, a great many people want to be Jesus, or Judas, or Peter or someone, just someone. At some point, nearly everyone wants to be part of a new religion because nearly everyone wants followers. Like-minded people in their little bubble doing like-minded things. Like-minded people in their little bubble shutting out other people because they're not part of the bubble's original design. Some new religions behave like cults. I know something about cults, the person or more says in their own voice. They sound just like a person, just like you and me. Evidence of realness in this room, which operates as an archive, theater, or museum. Cue, performance reenactment of ordinary person number one. I was in a cult once. I was part of what some people call the Great Derangement. It was a time of massive upheaval. Global sickness, wars, terrorism, fascism, and widespread famine. Pause performance reenactment of ordinary person number one. You may remember the time. You may be living it still. Resume play. The planet was burning then. It'd been burning for years. Those of us in the cult though pretend that everything was fine. We clothed ourselves in the fabric of denial because it was the easiest way to handle disaster. Uh, pause performance. Uh, psychologists have studied this phenomenon. Often people under extraordinary trauma develop an adaptive behavior whereby they simply refuse to believe that disaster is taking place. It's a coping mechanism of sorts. The more they see the disaster, the more they pretend it doesn't exist. These people are sometimes called the happy people. Resume play. I was a happy person. I was the happiest person in the world because the brick was my religion and I was one of its apostles. Stop, performance, reenactment. Ah, the brick. Religion is a life experience, someone says. Religion is big tech doing big things to render humanity obsolete, another person says. Religion is private economic freedom, someone chants very loudly, to which another person says, slow down, we're not there yet, aren't we? We're still in the room, just the room. Ah, yes, the room. Three, exhibit C, the room, Kronos time part one, the president. Now this room is next to another room, which is a room of war, power, and more war. A long time ago, when this room was first cleaned, before it became other rooms in other cities around the world, the room next door belonged to a president who spearheaded a coup in his country. Digital vampire ghost body of the president appears. Hello, I was once your favorite tyrant. The president's digital vampire ghost body says, sounding a bit like an exaggerated movie version of Dracula. I was your most favorite of all. Lots of reverb on the all. Oh, uh, less reverb, please. Oh, thanks. The person or more in this archive theater museum speak to the president's digital vampire ghost body. President, you're not the most favorite tyrant. Don't be unkind, amigo, amiga, amigues. I did a lot of good for the world. Now, some books will say that the president was indirectly responsible for administering the deaths of nearly 100,000 or more, the imprisonment of many, and the torture of hundreds. We're still 
unaccounted for, but she was great for transnational commerce and media ratings. But I only did what a leader in my position had to do. Identifying me is easy when you know full well that there are plenty of war criminals in the world that are sitting around painting pictures of puppies or playing golf. Besides, without me, you would not have the world you have today or tomorrow. Precisely. Tis, tis, amigo, amiga, amigues. Stop with the snarky face. I am the original upon which so many other carbon copies have been derived. Somehow the president is starting to sound a bit like a racist Hollywood movie version of an Italian gangster or an angry ethnic baddie. Without me, you wouldn't have the beautiful deregulation of markets, privatization of all necessary things, the industrial military prison complex, and concentration of capital in the hands of only a select few. Canned applause to which the president's digital vampire ghost body bows. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear one percenters. And because of me, we reap the benefits of the most wonderful global inequality, the perpetual extraction of labor, emotion, and suffering of the poor, and the extraction of natural resources and suffering of the planet. More can applaud Miss Doubtridge. So much suffering that the poor cannot even think about what they can do to stop the vertical flow of capital, and the planet in turn is decimated. Thank heaven, we still have outer space. Even more can applause to which the president's digital vampire ghost body exults. All this generates a most tremendous autopoetic feedback loop, one which repeats until our brand of capitalism cannibalizes itself. Suspend the president's digital vampire ghost body. The feedback loop to which it refers is one that transcends free trade and open markets because it is also an environmental feedback loop leading to total and complete social and ecological global collapse. The sharp echo of an actor shouting, yippee ki yay in a popular Hollywood action movie from another time is heard reverberating through the archive. yippee ki yay total and complete social and ecological global collapse. That is an extreme view, amigo, amiga, amigues. It is reality. The reality of pessimists and doomsayers. There is no room for such thought in our world. A collapsing society is merely an arena for hope. Are you for real? I am a ghost, but I am real. As real as that brick shining in the light. Ah, the brick. The person or more and the president's vampire digital ghost body stare at the brick. It is beautiful. So full of possibility. Bendiciones, querido ladrillo, salvador de nuestras vidas. Sometimes I speak Spanish and other official colonial languages of the conquered. The president's digital vampire ghost body makes the sign of the cross with his digital hands. He pauses for a moment in reverence to the brick. Then he looks up as if the blood in his digital vampire ghost body was coursing at an alarming speed. Exit suspension mode. The autopoetic feedback loop is in acceleration, a one that repeats exponentially until our brand of capitalism cannibalizes itself. And here, I mix my metaphors intentionally, because although you see me in the system I represent as a vampire, uh, President Dracula, we are also cannibals, uh, feeding on present and future flesh, and the present and future elements of existence in water, fire, earth, and space. Crunchy feasting sounds are heard from the soundtrack of humanity and the planet's extinction, delirious canned laughter, followed by strange sounds of crying. Now, now, amigo, amiga, amigues, be not despairing. Our decadent and cannibalistic instincts have been primed for years, and some say these instincts were built into the brick itself. You should be grateful, amigo, amiga, amigues, because this, this theater of sorts, and this little show, does anyone attend the theater anymore? Um, such a pathetic display of narcissism. Imagine people wanting to see other people doing things to remind them what people do and think. People need reminding. It is an absurdity. Cartoon music followed by canned laughter. But what can we do? We are here in this theater of sorts. We are here because of me. Uh, actually, don't pretend theater and our brand of capitalism have nothing to do with one another. I don't play the part of the radical naive. We are beyond that. You know as well as I that earnestness is merely a sales pitch, a way to hook people so that they will buy things. Now, sometimes it is in fashion and sometimes it is considered archaic, but it is a wonderful hook because people mistake it for what is real. They should know that reality is and always has been a show. 
The president sips on a digital glass of Cabernet Sauvignon. Soft, sentimental guitar music is heard in the background as if he were on a TV commercial. Uh, I miss Cabernet Sauvignon. Where I'm from, we made the best Cabernet, much better than those of other places. The president's digital vampire ghost body leans in with conspiratorial air, exuding the pose of pseudo-millennial dudish broness. You should go to my place sometime when the planet cools down and all the flowers stop eroding, all the villages and cities. You should experience the beauty of our wine. Even this Cabernet, which is a simulacro and real, is the best. Pause music. Suspended digital vampire ghost body. Delete. Roll up. Did you? We don't need the wine. You may not need the wine, but I need the wine. How else will we achieve Bacchanalian excess at the end of the show, which will also be the end of our days? Repeat. How else will we achieve Bacchanalian excess at the end of the show, which will also be the end of our days? Reinsert wine, resume music, ex suspension mode. I would sing you another song, but I will save it for later, for when the Bacchanal will consume us and we will all be the most wonderful mutant vampire cannibals in the world. Uh, you think I don't see the future? Uh, you have some in my digital body, amigo, amiga, amigues. You have done so because you know I know things and because in this world of many tyrants and wannabe tyrants, you fancy being me for the change. No. Listen, as I said before, because history repeats itself and nobody learns anything, almost everything you have ever known in your sorry little lives is because of me. Without me, you would not even exist. Not really. I know. I know what you think. The archive says the boys did it. The so-called city boys gave birth to everything. A spectral shiver is felt in the air. And uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, me too. Don't don't forget me. The insistent digital ghost body of an influential economist appears. Let's call him Tilly. The two digital ghost bodies speak to one another in real time, fragment from memory. Tilly, mon ami, the world will never forget you. You were one of its supreme architects. You were one of the gods to whom we all pray. Padre Tilly, todo poderoso, santificado sea tu nombre. I, 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 I'm just a humble servant, President. No nonsense. You are yours, Tilly, and the kings. Oh, Pres, you flatter me. I tickle you. No, I do. Even from here, from the ghostly realm. Oh, stop, Prezi. You don't mind if I call you Prezi, do you? You have my full blessing. Thank you, Prezi. You always used to like my tickles, Tilly Poos. Now remember when I used to call you Tilly Poos back when we were sunbathed naked on the beach near the coast? Oh, yes. All those cabana boys and whiskey sours. So many whiskey sours we drank. We were encourageable brutes. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Prezi. Tickle, tickle. Prezi. Tickle, tickle, tickle. tickle. Prezi. Tickle, 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 tickle. President. Tickle, 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 tickle. The tickle digital ghost body of Tilly, the influential economist, disappears. More on Tilly later. I miss Tilly. He was a true friend. He visited my place many times and had his own show for a while, too. I believe it was called Free to Choose. Such beautiful words, so comforting, so true. We wouldn't say, no, of course not. You wouldn't give him and his team the credit for the transformation of the universe and the efficient brutality and selfishness of contemporaneous existence because you are soft things. We're not soft. You are soft machines, nothing more. Upset hoo, 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 at the total barbarism of the world. Oh, you soft things. Sudden ambient echo of a glam pop song is heard. The person or more sway to its beat, captivated by its mordant vision of bitter excess. The earth is a bitch, they quote, the earth is a bitch, after which. But enough about our genius. We must remember that this room, because such are the whims of archives, theaters, and museums, will be known as the City Boys Room. Spectral shiver is felt in the air. Because it was here that they envisioned the potentiality of the brick. Ah, the brick. Yes, I gave the city boys some of the best economic strategies in the world. Go ahead. You could say we were in bed together and we were very good in bed. 
An upbeat dance pop song is heard in all its autotune glory. A blast of cool fuck you energy in this postmodern, baked post human, but still catastrophically settler colonialist, patriarchal, politically white dominant world. The president lip thinks to the song, but maybe that's what makes us good in bed. Dance break with the president's digital vampire ghost body and the spirits of this room. Four. Exhibit D, interstitial disaster object, glitch time. After the dancing and the smoking and the drinking and many cups of digital Merlot and the memory of its taste upon the tongue, voices are heard from the heart of tragedy. Black box recording from the disaster. 40 seconds until we crash. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. We're hit. It's no mistake in it. So much blood. So much. We are going down. There's the planet. We're going down. So, so much. Someone, this is the planet. Copy. What? This is it, baby. This is. Hold on, world. We love you. Five. Exhibit E, The Room, Chronos Time, Part Two, The Economist. After a long silence. Rewind. A long time ago, when this room was first cleaned, before it became other rooms in other cities around the world, the room next door belonged to a president who spearheaded a coup in his country. Uh, fast forward, a select group of big tech billionaires are snorting cocaine on a simulacrum of a yacht in the middle of the room. That's a little too fast forward. Rewind, please. The president was highly favored by an international political mixer and also was favored by a very influential economist and his team. Let's still call the economist Tilly. You met his digital ghost body earlier. The influential economist taught at a famous university in a big city and somehow hooked up with the president, even though the economist said he had no real interest in politics. Part two, hypothetical television interview with digital ghost body of the influential economist based on a fragment of a real television interview. And now, live from our studio in downtown anywhere, this is Tilly, the influential economist. Revved up, audience agitation music from an unseen band. Delirious, canned applause. Part two, meat of interview. Meat? It's a term. I don't like the term. It's like I'm an animal in a slaughterhouse. Well, theoretically, humans and animals are not separate entities. It's a modernist, Eurocentric notion to think otherwise. Just say interview, okay? Cut to interview. Uh, 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 I'm a believer in economics, that is all. The influential economist says in a modest, measured tone, the market is the world. Mimicry is not required. Okay. The influential economist could be the influential economist without your having to mimic an actual influential economist. It's called acting. Uh, you can just be yourself. Ah, uh, the market is the world. But uh, Tilly, uh, uh, no, no, I, I am firm in this. I always have been. You've watched me on television, perhaps in the archive. Trade should be free. Money should be free. There should be freedom for money at the expense of people. Sorry. There should be freedom for money at the expense of people. Amplified echo resonates in the room. But, but Tilly, the condition of the working class, don't get all Marx and Engels on me, for God's sake. Now, Marx and Engels were communist idealists. Their critique of capital was a beautiful romantic theory, emphasis on the theory that simply does not work in practice. Social democratic systems that redistribute wealth and could create more equitable societies are in fact Snooze, 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 poppycock. Sorry. Let me tell you something, dear person or more. An audience, too. Hello, audience, wherever you are. Bless you, for you are blessed consumers. Can the pause. Social democratic systems are anathema to true independence. Now, people used to tell me back when the president and the city boards were firing up the brick and making all of it happen that what was going on there in this, there, our room, was too strict. A while later, 
all people could talk about was the shock of it all as if it were evil. Well, guess what, dear person of war and my blessed consumers, societies need shock, not that they progress. So there's no real change without violence. So first it hurts, of course it does. It's like getting electroshock therapy. Have you ever gotten electroshock therapy? Ah, uh, no, uh, it's very discombobulated, naturally. But when you come out of it, up the other end, so to speak, it's a wonderful thing because you are a new person. Shock therapy is a silver lining. A silver lining, yes. Look for the silver lining. The influential economist remembers a quaint pop song from a bygone era. Look for the silver lining. Societies need the shock of new things, new world orders, not this antiquated Marxist horse shit that gets trotted out every time, every single time there's a societal break, rupture, what have you. You mean global revolutions, wholly unjustified brutal invasions called wars, global financial crises and massive protests. Global financial crises was, is, or a tragedy. We cry many tears, but protests are futile. Actually, they, banks will always get bailed out. Protests are futile. The person or more makes a fist. They aim it at the hypothetically televised digital ghost body of the influential economist and the upper echelons of the global financial political sector. The economist stops the person or more's fist with his digitally televised ghost palm. So much anger is not good for the system, Tilly says. I lost my house. I lost everything. The person more says in a voice, just like you and me. In fact, they are like you and me. They are a person in the world. Evidence of realness in this room, which is an archive theater museum. Cue performance reenactment of ordinary person number two. My entire life, I have made minimum wage, which didn't go up hardly at all for more than 30 odd years. I have been subject to systemic historical wage stuff since the first day I started working. But I kept working, uh, even when they said they only needed me part time instead of full time. I kept working even when I was sick and everyone in my family got sick. I kept working because it was my identity. Just like buying a house was my identity. Just like shopping became my identity. I put in hundreds of thousands of hours at work at the expense of my health and happiness and of my family. And then one day, out of nowhere, bank said, sorry, that house is not yours. Sorry, your personhood means nothing to us. Sorry, but we're not sorry. And I was like, how can this be? I put in the time, I put in the hours, I put in my very self, flesh and bone, I put in my hard earned money. What in heaven's name are you telling me, Mr. Bank people? To which they replied, we play with your money and we aren't ever going to give it back. And performance reenactment number two. Isn't that the tale of woe you want me to witness? It's a story. Mere cognitive dissonance is all it is. Banks are not built to give anything back. They are built to profit off poverty. The person or more looks at the te digital televised ghost body of the influential economist as if they were a cartoon villain in a real life horror story. The influential economist signals that he and many other people he advises and trains with, which include women and others, is not a villain, but merely a person able to see the long view of the workings of the world. Person or more are, nonetheless, filled with incandescent rage. They want to scream and shout and take a hammer to the brick and smash it to pieces. First tectonic plate shift. But Tilly stops them from their vantage point in televisual history. Please, not the brick. The brick is innocent. It's just an object. Surely you understand how structures work. The economist croons like a band singer from another time. Yes, of course, the person or more has seen all the stories about all the bad money people doing all the bad money things. They are aware of systems called entertainment, which some people also call politics. They're part of the resounding chorus 
of the dispossessed. They know the litany of the chorus by heart. They celebrate it daily. Spotlight on the dispossessed, living their subaltern blues. They have lived and are living in a system that refuses care for and witness the suffering and dignity of the people called the working poor and the unhoused, and the people called migrants and asylum seekers and gig workers, the people paying with coins and cards to be able to buy the little things they need, and the people called students shot in classrooms, and the people called teachers shot in classrooms, and the people shot in shopping areas and metro stations and theaters and cinemas and grocery stores and cafes and churches and synagogues and mosques and parks and streets. And the people getting sick and dying from a variety of illnesses out of no fault of their own, out of no fault of their own, because bodies are machines that break when one least expects, and bodies are machines that break when a structure of caring does not exist, and bodies are people that break when a system considers them disposable. Sacrificial lambs on the altar of robber barons called oligarchs, and on the altars of kings and queens and their histories of barbaric monarchism. And and thuggish politicians in smooth fashion and neoconservative evangelical Christians using God as a cover for their sins. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. The faith halls ring. They have lived and are living in a structure that says the best thing you can be is to be a bank, a corporation, or a thing. A thing made of thinness, not of peopleness, a thing made of thinness, not of plantness, a thing made of thinness that looks like a theater full of objects, a theater that is a gun. They have lived and are living in a structure that also says the best thing you can do is to become a gun and kill things because a gun is an object, an object lesson and a lesson that objects that passes down from one generation to another and its noise can be heard around the world and its noise can be heard around the world and its noise can be heard down through the centuries and its noise is called by some a holy and indivisible sign of progress. Spotlight dims on the blues of the chorus of the dispossessed. The influential economist looks at the person or more from the comfort of their chair in hypothetical and semi real televisual history. They want a drink or a smoke, something intoxicating, something not too extreme but just enough to blunt the ghost of a headache that is burring inside the ghost of their brain. Look for the silver lining. Look for the silver lining. The person or more looks at the static phantom image of the influential economist as if they were their father or grandfather because in some ways he is. Where are my slippers, Charlie? The influential economist speaks from a private memory that is not part of the archive. I, I can't I can't find them anywhere. Your skin bristles at the tenderness they suddenly feel toward him. I'm losing everything. Every little thing. Because yes, he too was a person once, before his sign was presented by a person more called actors in this archive theater and museum, and he too dreamt things, and he too loved people, animals, plants, stones, rivers, before his heart became a brick. The economist stares at the person or more from the frame that encloses him. He reaches out towards them for a moment with his ghostly hands, gesture of forgiveness from the halls of patriarchy. The person or more feel as if they should respond to the economist's gesture, call it an instinct, a reflex, a condition of being human, but somehow they... The economist withdraws their hands from the static of the air. White noise is heard from the hypothetical and real museum of television. The person or more rewinds, resume, interview. Then the year of the uprising were, oh, that, 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 that was a failure. That's not true. Are you in the truth business, dear person or more, in a post-factual world? Let me tell you my truth. You already have been in the year of the uprising. Oh, 
people all over the world uprising for justice against oppression, speaking to the cracks in the system, to the inhumanity of people against people, calling for the extermination of all the brutes, only made the system and its structure strengthen their resolve. We love that shit. As a foul mouth friend in college used to say to me back when we were dreaming of the beginning of our economic theories, cracks and capital are convenient motherfuckers. Cracks in capital are necessary to our true emergence and liberation. Cracks in capital are temporary distortions, nothing more. I repeat, the market is the only liberated object. In a transactional world, it is the purest, most beautiful abstraction. Built on the bloodstream of a labor force that, for God's sake, Marx and Engels had patrons back in their day. They were backed by wealth. If they didn't have capital, no one would even know who Marx and Engels were. All that pseudo-romantic Marxist theory about workers' rights is regurgitated year after year after year after year after year after year, after year, after year. like an old song heard on a creaky radio. You're not going to cue a song? I wasn't planning on it. I thought we said it's not on my cue sheet. Tilly deserves a song, a popular song. You don't have one. I could make something up. Please don't. I want to sing them. Doesn't go with vibe. What vibe? The influential economist vibe. Tilly has plenty of vibes. Tilly needs a song. Even in hypothetical television such as this, songs are very effective messaging agents. Uh, come on. Puppy pleading face. I can do it. I can make it a grand spectacle. All shows need spectacle. It's one of the five elements of drama. Oh, the person of more thinks. They don't really believe in drama. They think drama has been used to justify far too many wars and excuse much of the world's iniquity. The person or more think drama can take a hike, hike, head off to the mountains, if they're still there, and take a good long rest. But we are and have been in the society of spectacle, even if now it is in its most decadent stage, as a song might just be. The person or more offers. Okay, satisfied smile. Q, song, and spectacle. The digital ghost body of the influential economist lip syncs an anthemic popular song on a raised stage that resembles a golden pyramid. Think Eurovision. Below him, hordes of people enter a faux designer hospital chic. They stalk the stage as if they were zombie photographs for an atrocity exhibition. The economist struts and swaggers in the spotlight, oblivious to the necropolitical figures below him, alive in the snarl and croon of his pop icon combined singer pose. This is his moment. This is his way. He revels in it. My way. My way. The song builds to a frenetic state of Ertzat's pop punk ecstasy as a history of transnational socioeconomic political carnage lies at his feet. The hordes of people in faux designer hospital speak are mere bones now, skeletal remains. They walk as if on stilts toward a loading dock of dreams. Goodbye, people. You are useful for a while. You made our way complete sound of human remains being dumped onto a trash heap is heard. Waste pickers appear from the fugitive places in the undercommons and fight over the vestiges of what used to be called fashion before they too are swept away by the police. The influential economist stares in the eyes of the imagined camera doing his best drag version of mega pop iconness with a side eye of Sinatra, while the side ghosts of thin white dukes from various white ages use the sheen of their whiteness to sell the glamour of soul. We are only what we buy and what we sell. Tilly Croon speaks in dulcet tones of amorality. This is the way to freedom. The song and spectacle ends. The influential economist bows. He is met with a strange and eerie silence. Tilly stares at the crowd. Worship me, he whispers in his heart. There is only the sound of stuttered breathing, like the crackle and hiss from a machine. The influential economist continues whispering in his heart, Worship me. Worship me. The beggared adoration of the faithless is his only reward. As we hear, a torrent of canned applause, the perfect disembodiment of the flesh surreal. Resume interview. Oh, I'd like some water, please. I'm thirsty. Putting on a show is hard work. Feel my heart. It's racing a mile a minute. That's just adrenaline. That may be, but I need water. We need to resume the presentation of the interview. We don't need to do anything.
The simulation of productivity is just an excuse to keep capital flowing. Water, however, is something we all need. We're conserving. One glass, that's all. It's not on the list. Add it to the list. We added the moment of spectacle, didn't we? But the people, they might want some water too. We could all do with a glass of water, right? Okay, but just one glass because conserving, we know. The person or more hands a glass, a real glass of real water to the other person or more. The audience also drinks real glasses of water, even if it's only in their imagination. The other person or more haven't tasted real water in a long time. In the town where they lived once, there hadn't been clean water for years. It feels good to taste the real thing. Must be expensive. Hmm? The water. Oh, the Archive Theater Museum stock it. I thought we were conserving. They have a backup in their vaults. I see. The other person or more savors the real water. The person or more suddenly doesn't know what to do with their hands. You okay? Huh? Remember, there's more to life than work. Resume interview. Prax and capital are liberation of the oppressed, equitable food and shelter for everyone, fair wages to meet the cost of living, abolish the carceral state, blah, blah, blah. It's total adolescent malarkey. It's not realistic. The market state exists to capture the life of a person and their role and what the state needs. Cognitive capture because the market state is supreme, but a multiracial, pluralistic democracy would still be tied to the market state. You don't believe me? A third way is possible. There isn't a third way. There isn't a third or fourth or even a fifth way. The influential economists look to the camera, which is still the audience. There isn't another way. You believe in fascism then? I, I, I believe in markets. Their fascistic capacity as overlords do. Are you quoting from an action adventure sci-fi series? This is not any of those things. This is the great origin story, the only origin story, hypercapitalism, pure and simple. The oppressed will never be truly free because the market needs their eyeballs and their capacity to consume. What do you think the Enlightenment was all about? The politically white Enlightenment, permanent illumination, empires of light, photonic beams obliterating sleep, perfect fiber optic tunnels running between the financial centers of cosmopolitan cities, delivering accelerated messages of hope for the dismantling of all institutions idea co-opted from the oppressed and reconfigured for other means to fix the oppressed in an illusion of movement, the latest vehicle, gadget, platform, or retail entertainment experience, without which they cannot move at all because their movement is constantly policed. Their bodies, voices, faces, ages, genders, ethnicities, castes are rendered and cataloged and turned into the private property of empire itself, while the market is free, as free as a bird in the sky. Cue disembodied bird song. Soaring above all else, like a quiet night at the university when I'd sit down with a glass of whiskey and ponder the magnificent possibilities of the universe. For a moment, an amplified, slightly distorted echo of the anthem pop song The Economist Lip Synced is heard, as if it were signaling from another dimension. In a physical and virtual financial world, capital captures every single atom of society. Fascism is good business and good for business, period. Fade on the hypothetical television interview with the digital ghost body of the influential economist. Six, exhibit F, the room, just the room. The person will breathe. <laughs> they are exhausted by capital. You know, they wonder what the plants, animals, stones, rivers, and microbes will think when they walk into this room one day. The person will think the plants, animals, stones, rivers, and microbes won't survive. They may never even see this room. They may be forever lost to the archive. First of all, stare at the brick. It is still in its light. It is remarkably resilient. We should do something about it, the person of more says. I know. For a moment, they breathe, sort of in sync. They remember when that was a thing that used to happen in theaters called societies. 
it feels good to breathe. Yes, the person more says, and there are many languages. Yes, see, Gabon, I want da ham shiden. There, yes, feels the way hope once felt before it became a word whose meaning was used to elect people and sell things. They imagine the brick in their hands. They imagine throwing it through a window or over a wall or fence. They imagine civil disobedience. They are on fire. Their fire is contagious. They want it to mean something. They don't want to think that their fire is merely a convenient interlude from which others can profit. They want to be warriors. They want the world at their feet. They want to smash the president, the influential economists, and all their friends and protégés with all their multiple brands of capitalism into oblivion. You are dust, babies, they shout. You are at the end of the end of history. You are at the end of the end of the future. Their fire is one for the ages. They know this because they dreamt this. They dreamt this in this room before it was an archive theater museum and before it was the room next to the room of war and power and more war. They dreamt this when this room was just a room that held their dreams. For a moment, it's just their fire and their breathing. The brick's gravity is a mere stone in their hands. For a moment, they are beyond the brick and its walls, beyond all its tragedies. They are reversing the trajectory of settler colonialist, imperialist, patriarchal history. They are heroes. They know this. They don't have to prove it to anybody. The knowledge fills them. We are heroes the person more say with no irony they stand tall defiant they raise their arms they raise their hammers a perfect image of worker solidarity second tectonic plate shift and then for a split second they see themselves in the camera's eye because the camera's eye is always here even when it's not is this what hope really looks like? Their faces are full of debt. Their faces are full of poverty. Their faces are not faces that break the endless cycle of breaking news. Their faces belong to the Museum of Austerity, the Museum of Precarity. The brick stares at them. You love me, the brick says. You need me. Without me, you are nothing. Person or more put down their hammers. They feel the sudden rush of faith enter their bones. The kind of faith that feels like the potential attainment of property. The brick says, you are devoted to me. Seven, Exhibit G, The Room, Chrono Time Part Three, The City Boys and the Bros, and a person or more look at the room. <laughs> the room is still the room. The table is still here, and also, sadly, the unflattering light. When are they going to fix the light? The room is still next to the room of war and power and more war, but now. It is late night. You might be able to see a bit of the world through the window. You might even see a glimmer of the moon. The specters of the so-called city boys are also in this room. They have been here a long time. They have been patiently waiting. Hey, they say, hey. They look just like regular people in the world. They could almost be like you and me if they weren't specters. The city boys wonder if you remember them. Perhaps you sensed their presence once or twice a little earlier. Something like a spectral shiver in the air. They were protégés of the influential economist and also close friends and allies of the president, but they're not interested in politics. Their only interest is in private global economics. Or rather, their only interest is in what they call a new realism, which makes the political an impossibility. The specters of the so-called city boys want you to know that they are not, or ever have been, the bad guys. 
well, no, they don't see themselves as the bad guys. They see themselves as miracle workers instead, or prophets, duh. The city boys have an investment in a prophetic future. They love the future. They love it so much, they care very little about the present. The present is past. Out you go, stupid present. There's only our way. In this respect, they're almost exactly like their teacher, the influential economist. My way, my way. And the president's vampiric animation. My way, my way. <laughs> they try to forget the president existed, though. His kind of terror is not their style. But their teacher, on the other hand, sometimes when they look in the mirror with the camera's eye, they're surprised how much they're like their teacher. They were good students, after all. That's why they're still here in this archive theater and museum. Without them, there would be no reality. The specters of the city boys work as a team. They're sort of like a band. Mic check for the spectral city boys, please. Uh, check one, check two, check, check three. Am uh, I okay? Uh, let's bring it up and check uh, one, check two, loud and clear. On this night, which is a night in the past, the spectral city boys are involved in labor. They are drafting a document that they will hand over to the president and the rest of the world. They've been working on the document for hours, and it feels like they're playing a gig at the end of a long tour. And this document is their signature song. Last night with the city boys live from the red room of history. City boys are tired, but they're not giving up on their fans. Oh, we love our fans, even if they don't always love us. Spectral city boys understand the importance of being committed to the people. Well, not all the people. The city boys didn't really say that. Yes, we did. Strike that from the archive, please. No, we're okay with being reflected honestly. We have always believed in authenticity. That's why our fans are still our fans. You know, other economic bands have come and gone, but we, we've been around several trips around the moon, and gosh darn it, we're still here. The uh, Spectral City Boys suddenly seem to speak with a country twang. Well, we, we like to present an illusion of authenticity, even if we're all part of a ruling elite. People like the sound of home. There are many kinds of homes, a certain kind of down home, bespoke plainness. Lots of people respond to that sound with positivity. So we give it to them, even when we speak in double speak. Spectral City Boys down, ghostly jugs of whiskey. Uh, it's, it's actually digital Cabernet Sauvignon, like the president had, but the jugs confirm the down home aesthetic. For the set list tonight, the Spectral City Boys are going to play their greatest hits at the long table where decisions get made. Spotlight on the long table, which is now its own stage. Yeah, we uh, don't want to mix it up too much. <laughs> no, we're slow and steady, as they say. That's something Tilly, our teacher, taught us back when we were at university. He said it was always best to speak plain and play it straight to the heart. None of this highfalutin nonsense. Uh, everything we do is for the people. Our mantra, just like our teachers, is free to choose. Our fans know that. They repeat it everywhere we play. Do we have some fans out there? Do we hear our free to choose? Oh, don't be shy. I just shout it. Free to choose. Free to choose. Can't shout from the masses. Hell yeah. That's a sound we like. Total free bird. The Spectral City Boys strike a hard rock metal pose. We figure country and metal go together like market and stay. It's now the last few minutes of their set. They've been working the room for most of the night. Their fans, the president, their teacher, international government fixers, and the ruling classes have put their entire faith in them. They're the best and brightest band, after all. And on their shoulders, a part of the world will assert its newfound destiny. The Spectral City Boys are giving it their all. Oh, if nothing else, we believe in giving people a show. They roll up their ghostly sleeves and cast off their ghostly ties. They think about their ancestors in the archive, the ones that also believed in settler colonialist Eurocentric modernity. They want to do them proud. This one's for the people in the back, the Spectral City Boys shout. We're going to hunker down. The sound of a steady bass is heard, like the sound of toxic productivity. The Spectral City Boys shuffle through stacked papers. Freedom, they sing, as they clock how many things they can refashion with the strokes of their guitar-like pens. Freedom is a wild thing. The spectral halls and tone with their gyrating hips. This is how the new market crowd will live, they proclaim. Private economic freedom and political terror. 
their sound is sharp and heavy. The band's groove is low and steady. They're in it for the kill. Institutionalized brutality. Suppression of the scent. Mass hunger and unemployment. This is your freedom. They sing out in the blazing light that contains them. Disequilibrium, inequality, deregulation. No community. This is your freedom. They play the hard jam with their last jam with the knowledge that their fans are protecting them and their imminent economic blueprint. Polluted waters, polluted air, talk and clutch and rapid food deserts. This is your freedom. While the people, the other people, the ones that were promised once the beauty of the commons, the ones that tasted it for a moment and held its sweetness on their lips and saw the potential grace of its deliverance, are thrown into the pits, the blinding fire of its all consuming whiteness. This is your new religion. They holler with every fiber of their spectral being. This is your new religion, and you will follow, and you will follow. Their refrain is relentless and hypnotic. You will follow as the papers they shuffle at the long table are assembling themselves into a book. The book of faces, the book of traces, the book of all logos. You will follow, you will follow. Hello, imagine nothing else. They spin their electric spell with the precision of seasoned prose. They know the score because they are the score. Their sound is the new realism, and they will teach their children well. Imagine nothing, nothing else. The hook is in, the drums stay on the beat, the song is burdened into the wave of the global landscape until every time someone tries to imagine something else, something other, freeze. The spectral city boys beaming live from the red room of history. Cue performance reenactment of ordinary person number three. Ever since I can remember, I've had issues with mental health. It started when I was about 12. I would look in the mirror and feel defeated about everything because everyone I knew was doing so much. They were accomplishing so many things. They were like famous for their image and what they said about other people. And they looked perfect doing it too. And yes, they had filters, lots of filters, but also lots of plastic surgery. Even the ones that couldn't afford it would get it. They would save it for months, deprive themselves of things or get into deep debt. Like this one person that got into so much debt, they lost everything, everything in their life. And they look great. I mean, the image is important. I mean, that's what people value in the end. They don't value your insides. Your insides are ugly, <laughs> swimming in blood and bacteria. Nobody wants to see that unless you're making art about it or something. And even then, you must be like strategic or how you brand it, because it could be genius. But if nobody's watching, it doesn't exist. I tried finding it, but literally every single position I took that felt or was against would just feel false or somebody would copy it. And I'd see my stance, my position, my words or thoughts or whatever on a tote bag or something. And I was like, I'm not a tote bag, but if I'm gonna be a tote bag, give me the money. Because that's the thing. I spend every single day thinking about money and how I'm going to make it. I can't think or do anything else. It's a totally fascist thing. But that's the world we live in. Canned applause. Ordinary person number three looks at the audience. Maybe they wipe away a tear. More canned applause. Ordinary person number three is moved by the applause. They cry some more. Their eyes are red, their face is a mess, their pain is on the outside. The canned applause becomes cheering, roaring, epic. Ordinary person number three feels heroic, like they have won a race or, or walked a thousand miles for their favorite charity. Maybe crying is all they needed to do to make something of themselves. 
maybe this is their way. They cry some more. This time, they call up all the pain they felt when they were 12 and tried every which way they could to self medicate The audience senses the pain of their 12-ness. We know what it's like to be 12, they say in their canned voices. Go, girl, boy, then. Ordinary person number three pushes themselves to perform their pain even more. They exert themselves. Their whole body is a map of distress. What is your story? Tell us your story. Ordinary person number three have heard these words for years. They know what that when these words are spoken, what is your story? Tell us your story. They must give. What is your story? Tell us your story because their story is all they have. In this realism, their story is their only currency. End performance reenactment of ordinary person number three. Unfreeze the city boys at the end of their set as they stare at the brick-like book they have assembled. The city boys are proud of themselves. The document will become is the Bible of the world. Now, even though it's just a document, big tech bros make a cameo appearance and speak. We'll make cash of it. Toast babies. We'll take it for a whole other level and do the city boys one better. We'll create storms of digital light that will radiate atriums of content and beautifully manufactured illusions of disruptive radicalism touched up with dynamic anarchic accents owned by one singular entity, our singular entity. The entire world will be privatized and there will be no public anything because the commons was and is a tragedy. Hoo hoo hoo, yippee ki yay, motherfucker. We'll even privatize stress. ka -ching. But on this night, while in the room next door, a crew is being struck with a global handshake, the spectral city boys are ready to celebrate the beginning and end of their long tour. Oh, we've been working hard. We have every right to celebrate because the document they have been dreaming of for a very long time is finally before their eyes. Hell yeah, we did it. We gave birth to the brick. The brick shines in the spotlight. Its beam illuminates the entire room and all the rooms beyond this room. It is the brick upon which all houses have been and will be built. It is the brick to end all bricks and it has been waiting. It has been waiting for this moment throughout the course of the entire evening's drama because it believes in and is made of and from drama and it demands your applause. Thank you. Thank you, says the brick. I want to thank everyone that has made me. I wouldn't be the brick I am today without you. The spectral city boys wave from their comfortable chairs at the long table as they down jugs of digital cabernet, Savignon that they tell people is whiskey. The digital vampire ghost body of the president waves from the Hollywood movie set that is filming his life story for a new generation to learn about the glamour of his crimes. This time it's a real vampire movie and the president will feast on the blood of the people in spectacular fashion. The actor playing her will win four golden statues for their hard labor of mercury because no one knows what acting is anymore. The digital ghost body of the influential economist waves from the hallowed halls of the many universities that honor him every year for his contributions to society. His name adorns campus buildings, government buildings, gay living communities, hospitals, archives, theaters, and museums just like this one. And nobody remembers a time before the brick came into their lives because it was always there waiting to be born. The sound of praying can be heard on the soundtrack of the planet's accelerated demise. Bendito ladrillo, el paz concebido, santificado sea tu nombre. The prayer begins swiftly and in earnest until everyone in the whole world is praying and singing and dancing in an undulating ecstatic trance. Gloria, Gia Roe, Gloria, Gia Roe, Gloria, Gia Roe, Gloria, in excelsis ladrillo. Outside the window, the glimmer of the moon and the world are caught in the eye of a storm. The moon and the world spin to a range of colors until the, all that can be seen are swirls of blue and red as they settle 
into the color of a bruise. Eight, exhibit H, interstitial disaster object, glitch time. After the praying and the singing and the dancing and many voyages around the world and its rooms of imperial decay, voices are heard from the heart of tragedy. Black box recording from disaster. 20 seconds until we cheer blood all over. How do we even like everything just tender, soft, so soft. I was a stone once, river. Here we go, love. Nine, exhibit I, the brick, end time. After a long silence. Reset. A long time ago, when this room was first clean, before it became other rooms in other cities around the world, this room was just a room. It was a place where people gathered occasionally to be with one another and maybe talk through and about things. In fact, people didn't even need a room to do that. Uh, the person or more remember a non-room from another time. It was called a field. We could get lost in it. Image of a field, perhaps painted by a child with crayons on cardboard, or maybe a blurry pixeled image. In the field, People and stones and plants and animals and rivers and insects and birds and trees and microbes lived on a continuum. Little to no hierarchy, no inequality, no political terror, just equilibrium. And people, stone, plant, animal, river, insect, bird, tree, microbe beings just were beings to and for one another. And the brick was just a brick. It had no authority. It only signified itself. The sound of a brick is heard as if it were sitting in a field in the sun. The sound is a low hum. Hum. Sometimes People, stone, plant, river, animals looked at the brick as they walked through the field. And they'd imagine how it was part of a house they lived in once. What a strange house it was, they'd say. It was full of blood and the sad logic of empty capital. It's amazing to think that so many people wanted to live in such a house. And also that a self-selected group of people made the living in it so unbearable for everyone for such a long time. The brick's hum begins to filter through the field and the non walls of the Archive Theatre Museum. Hum. Evidence of realness passing through the wilderness of the real. The person, stone, plant, river, animals, nonetheless, mourned the house. Because even houses of blood are time, and time and blood are one. Their mourning took the form of storytelling, and sometimes the singing of songs, and sometimes little performances of hypothetical scenes in the world of nature. And sometimes, too, it took the form of an action, like taking a hammer in their hands, raising it against the irreality of the brick, and saying, enough! Third tectonic plate shift. Um. 
is now like the sound of matter returning itself to itself. The person of Marseille, look, this is clay, lime, magnesia, and iron oxide. It used to be brick once. It was us. The person or more exit the room. Darkness. All right, give it up for Caridad. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Caridad, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight. We hope you uh, enjoyed it. And <clears throat> please visit uh, bricktheater.com or follow us on Instagram, uh, Twitter, find us on Facebook everywhere at Brick Theater. Um, we're so glad we got to have this experience with you uh, virtually. We will have more events um, happening in the virtual sphere. So uh, you can find us. You can also join our um, our mailing list. We put out a newsletter each week to keep up to date with what we're doing. Caridad, is there anything you'd like to say before we close out? Support the brick, y'all. <laughs> it's the forward independent art uh, in a country that's uh, less and less trying to support it. So, yeah. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you to say. We appreciate it. We're so glad we got to have the brick with the brick. Wonderful reading, wonderful work. So um, we will send out an email if anyone wants to revisit this over the next two weeks. And we have many friends who um, who are are doing that, but weren't able to join us live. So we'll be we'll be happy to hear reactions from.